Okay, so I'm ready to go. Well, okay, thank you very much, uh, uh, Jesper, and uh, it's great to see all of my old friends in Copenhagen and see some new ones, and uh, I've been looking forward to interacting with you. You can see on this those of you who've been at Caltech would recognize this first building as the Beckman Auditorium, which I have turned into the OXO wall. Um, and there, as you can see, the wall now, Jesper, is very, very big in the middle. Uh, my talk is life depends on metal OXOs. That's a pretty uh, strong statement, but uh, it turns out that life depends on the OXOs that on the left or the good side of the wall, namely manganese and iron, as we shall see in this talk. Uh, I have here on the uh, second slide, uh, three of the most important reactions on planet Earth. Uh, in fact, I would argue that photosynthesis and respiration, the oxidation of uh, water to oxygen and green leaves and the reduction, four electron reduction of oxygen in mitochondrial respiratory system all the way to water are the two most important reactions on the planet. Alkane oxidation is my third. It's not uh, number three on my list, but I put it number four on my all time list of important reactions. Uh, and that's alkane oxidation uh, catalyzed by cytochrome P450 uh, to make, uh, activate CH bonds to make alcohols. Uh, in the liver for so we so we can have sustain life uh, now uh, what motivates this talk is that uh, the important reactive intermediates in these three important reactions are all metal oxos multiply bonded metal oxos and of course i'm interested in this because i started this work in copenhagen as a uh, Jesper has mentioned uh, about 60 years ago when I was a postdoc with Bauhausen. Uh, uh, I was, I, and now I've been interested in, in the, these three reactive intermediates, uh, the one in photosystem two, which some, some people believe is a manganese five triple bond oxo. Other people have other mechanisms, but all the mechanisms all the mechanisms that have been proposed involve metal oxos, manganese oxos. This manganese triple boxo, uh, uh, the oxo uh, is really electrophilic. Uh, it's never been protonated. It's been estimated that the pK of this manganese five oxo for proton were on it, the pK would be minus 20. It'd be a super acid. Then if you go over to cytochrome oxidase, where the reactive intermediates in iron four oxo that's formed after OO bond cleavage, uh, uh, the pK of this system is now about three or four. So there's an enormous shift in pK from the triple bond oxo to the double bond oxo. And then if you go over to cytochrome P450, the Active intermediates are compound one, which is the double bond iron four oxo uh, with a radical on the, delocalized over the self, cysteine sulfur in the heme. Uh, and then if you reduce it to compound two, uh, which is just the, the iron four double bond oxo, uh, it's very basic. Uh, PK is 12. So the, remarkable thing in these metal oxos is the pk shifts 30 units from the triple bond oxos to the double bond oxos if they have very electron donating axial ligands like cysteine so how do we explain this well um here's the summary of my ligand field theory from copenhagen on the left which is the ligand field theory of a multiply bonded metal oxo, shown here as a triple bond oxo. There are three key levels. One is a doubly degenerate pi bonding level in the metal oxo. Second one is a non-bonding B2 or DXY orbital it's localized on the metal. And the third most important orbital is 
a pi star, the metal oxo pi star orbital. So with these three orbitals, you can you can count electrons. Uh, in the case of a D1 case, you would have a triple bond. A D2 case, you'd have the B2 occupied and have a singlet state and a, still a triple bond. Interestingly, if you go to D3 case, it becomes high spin with a triple with a quartet double bond. And you go to the fourth D electron, you have a double bond triplet state. Uh, each electron you put into E pi star changes the pK of the oxo by 10 units, as we have determined in various experiments. And so, but the, the maximum you can put in before the oxo collapses um, and is unstable is 4D electrons. So you can have a, a B2, two electrons and an E pi star with two electrons and a triplet state, but that's it. If you can't, the fifth electron, if it goes in, the system collapses. There are no examples. So with this, with this uh, criterion of a maximum of four D electrons, uh, there's a hard oxo wall between iron and cobalt, ruthenium and rhodium and osmium and iridium, because in order to get to a 3D4 configuration to a multiple bond oxo, the cobalt oxidation state would be so high, it would be so oxidizing there that the system would collapse and uh, make, high, make peroxide or oxygen directly. So there are no violations of a tetragonal oxo or a tetrahedral oxo for that matter beyond the oxo wall. There are many people who have claimed violations, but they're all wrong. Um, they're wrong because these things aren't tetragonal or tetrahedral. They have uh, lower coordination numbers. And lower coordination numbers, there's a different ligand field theory uh, for, for metal oxos. Uh, but now let's go to the uh, ones that are important in biology. These three are very important in biology. Manganese 5 triple bond oxo, which many people write as a double bond oxo, and I I like to write to them and tell them that's wrong. Uh, it's, a, it's a triple bond oxo. As you can see, the electronic structure is a singlet. Then the remarkable thing happens when you uh, add an electron to a manganese five triple bond oxo. The electron exchange, as we all know, in, uh, in three electron case versus two is bigger. And so uh, you end up with a high spin. You go from a low spin to a high spin oxo, populating the, uh, uh, pi star level uh, uh, and making it a, a quartet double bond oxo. The pK shift from a manganese five triple bond oxo to a manganese four double bond oxo is about 20 units. So that has major consequences in, in biology and in reactions. Then if you go all the way over to the iron four oxo, which is extremely important in biology and you see it everywhere, it's a, it's a triplet state because now you have two electrons in E pi star. Uh, and if you have an axial ligand like a cysteine, the, the pK now is 12. It's now a strong base and we protonated to make a, a, a hydroxy, a multiply bonded hydroxide system. That's very, very important for the uh, function of cytochrome P450. If that weren't if it weren't strongly basic, P450 couldn't work. Once again, I have a, a problem with the literature. The biochemists tend to call the ferrule line oxoferrule. Ferrule means oxo. So this really annoys me. Um, and <laughs> I know this is recorded, but I have to say I'm really... A, I'm really annoyed by people who make double bonds when they're triple bonds and when they say oxoferial when they should be saying ferial. Because oxoferial literally means oxo oxo, which is really stupid. And so um, I want all of you folks in Copenhagen to get out your red pens and go through biochemistry journals and X out all those oxoferials. And uh, then I'll be happy. Well, uh, just to uh, make the point once again, before we go forward, the triple bond ones, if they're protonated, are, they're super acids. 
The double bond ones are either weak acids or strong bases, depending on axial ligands and things like this. And so with the cysteine axial ligand uh, in P450, you get a pK of 12. So you have a very basic uh, double bond oxo. Uh, we have done work on excited state uh, protonations and so forth in the and the transdioxorenium 5 system and the ground state has a pK of zero. But in the first excited, the triplet excited state with one electron and pi star, you get the bump up of 11 pK units becoming basic in the excited state. And that's one of the examples that we have shown that every electron and pi star in an oxo gives you 10 pK units. Uh, so, uh, uh, this allowed us to uh, ex explain in a little more detail the key mechanism of cytochrome P450, which Mike, Mike Green, one of my postdocs, John Dawson, another postdoc of mine, and I published a science paper in 2004 explain it with some DFT work along with some XAFs experimental work, uh, showing that uh, the way the way the unactivated CH bond is is broken is due to the fact that the iron four oxo in compound one is a powerful oxidant. It's about one volt oxidizing versus the hydrogen electrode, and the thing that drives it is the PCET, the proton coupled electron transfer of the of the developing uh, basic oxo is able to pull the proton off to make the hydroxide. And the electron, of course, goes into the iron, uh, sorry, goes into the radical system to reduce that, uh, to make compound two. And then the rebound of the bound hydroxide to the carbon radical uh, makes the alcohol. So it's really a cooperation of a highly oxidizing iron uh, or radical center versus the developing basicity of the uh, of the oxo that allows you to break a very strong CH bond uh, with a, in a relatively uh, good way in this system. And so at this point, uh, of course, uh, Jay, Jay Groves at Princeton had proposed this mechanism many years before, and this is just a, a supporting evidence for the Groves rebound, famous rebound mechanism for P450. But at this point, uh, Michael Green took over and he's now done wonderful work uh, extending this to many systems and understanding it in more detail. But I have to tell you at this point, I felt that I understood enough about the mechanism and I turned my attention to something that, in, that I think is far more important. And that is how in the world uh, do we survive in the oxygen atmosphere in enzymes which are making these very high potential, very oxidizing intermediates, whose, whose oxidizing power is enough to completely uh, destroy the protein. In fact, the protein is more easily oxidized than the substrate in many cases. And so what, what is protecting these, all these metalloenzymes that use oxygen uh, to drive their reactions? And so Jay Winkler and I started thinking about this. And uh, by 2014, we had a hypothesis uh, that uh, the protection of, uh, of oxidative enzymes is tryptophan. The amino acid tryptophan, we hypothesize, is the protective amino acid. So in the upper part, you see the couple turnover, the turnover that works to by the rebound mechanism that I've just discussed uh, to make uh, alcohols out of alkanes. And the lower one, which in some of the, many of the most important P450s in the human body are only 10% efficient for the coupled one. And 90% of the time it goes uh, below on the uncoupled pathway. The uncoupled pathway, of course, comes and makes compound one, but no substrates there. So if it weren't protected, it would completely oxidize the protein and destroy your liver, and you wouldn't live very long, Morton. And uh, 
So uh, Winkler, Winkler and I made this, what I call a fairly bold and maybe ridiculous hypothesis um, that tryptophan is the key amino acid that protects protect us from, from oxidative degradation. Uh, that has to do with the potential of tryptophan and how it matches the potentials and a lot of other things. Uh, but I won't give you all the reasons we did this, but uh, uh, I went to England, the uh, Royal Society, and tried this out on the Royal Society. And I said, this was a, a, a crazy hypothesis, but the British, of course, wouldn't accept that when they published it. They called it an, an opinion piece. <laughs> uh, the good old British. Uh, they always save me when I get into trouble. Anyway, um, uh, what we decided is there would, and these oxos, these reactive oxos, there must be a tryptophan that couldn't be too close. If it were too close, it would uh, short the system out. It would never be able to uh, oxygenated substrate. So we, we guessed the tryptophan would have to be a, at least seven angstroms of, away from the heme. Uh, uh, seven and maybe as far as 12 angstroms, but seven angstroms, according to our electron tunneling timetables that we worked out over the years that Jesper mentioned, uh, would, uh, would give uh, electron transfer into this oxidized heme that would be in the hundreds of nanosecond range. We thought that would allow enough time for the substrate to be oxygenated if, uh, if it were there, but if it wasn't there, it could be taken care of by tryptophan. And then you make compound two, another tryptophan then knocks it back to the, the uh, resting state. So that's our hypothesis. So we decided to get to see if we could get structural evidence for it. So we interrogated the 100,000 odd structures in the protein data bank. And guess what? In every enzyme that uses oxygen and has a metallo cofactor, there's actually a tryptophan uh, pretty much in the seven to 12 angstrom range from the active site. Not only that, there's a chain of tryptophanes and tyrosines that go out to the surface where the uh, uh, oxidized uh, chain could be protected, but could be uh, reduced by cellular, cellular reductance like glutathione or ascorbic acid. So here's the story. Here's uh, one of the most important P450s, the CYP3A4. It metabolizes in the human liver, metabolizes uh, 20 or 30 things. And sure enough, it's got a, a tryptophan, seven angstroms from the heme and a, and a tyrosine at the surface. So, so using our... Uh, tunneling timetables, and then uh, uh, we can make those into hopping maps by doing a couple differential equations and going from tunneling, single step tunneling to multi-step tunneling. Uh, we showed that uh, this system could be protected in 200 nanoseconds. That is, that's the tryptophan tunneling uh, into, the, into a oxidized team compound one. It's slightly uphill to the tryptophan cation and downhill to the tyrosine, but the, the protection time is 200 nanoseconds, so-called survival time. And so basically what this tryptophan is saying to this P450 heme, it says, look, Mr. Heme, if you, don't ox if you don't oxygenate a substrate in 200 nanoseconds, I'm going to protect you. I'm going to reduce you. And then I'm going to reduce your partner compound two again. So you go back to the resting state. So you don't, you don't oxidize my, my enzyme and you don't ruin my liver. So is there any experimental evidence for this? Well, I am the English and Canada has some evidence in peroxidases that there are protective chains. And here's where my Danish friends come in, uh, Torsten Hansen and Meta Sorensen and others who've worked with us on this problem. Uh, Torsten and Meta's work uh, identified TRIP96 in this P450BM3 as a critical, critical uh, 
7.3 angstrom for the heme as a critical uh, protective agent and published a paper on that. But then there's a chain uh, that goes from trip 96 to trip 90 at the surface and tyrosine 334. And uh, we thought this was, would be a good system to see if we could get experimental evidence uh, for protection. And so we've been able to mutate all these residues to redox inactive residues. And we would think if this were really a protective chain, if you, uh, uh, if you took them out and put in uh, things like histidines and phenylalanines that uh, the protection would be completely gone and the uh, enzyme would not work anymore. Well, that's not quite true. Here's what happens when you do turnovers. With the wild type uh, BM3, it turns over substrates about 350 times before it uh, stops working. If, if you take this key tryptophan 96 and change it to histidine, the single mutant, you drop, uh, drop down to around 200 turnovers and you make the double mutant a little further and you make the triple mutant even further down. So there is some, there is some experimental evidence that there is, uh, that this chain is at least provides some protection, but there must be something else to the story because it, it doesn't go all the way down to complete destruction or <laughs> inactivation of the enzyme. So at this time, uh, Jay went back <laughs> protein data bank again and looked, looked harder. And what you find is in these oxidative enzymes, you find multi multiple protective chains. There's a lot of redundancy. We found five more chains in PM3 that looked like they could operate. So uh, the, the uh, protein is taking no chances. <laughs> if you knock out one of the chains, it's got four or five more. And so uh, in order to uh, show that these things are really protective, we're gonna have to knock out all of these chains and, and see what happens. So that's where we are. Anyway, uh, what I was saying here is that another bit of evidence that we may be on the right track is uh, uh, is as the heme gets more and more buried in these oxidative enzymes, the chains get longer and longer so they can get out to the surface. And here's a very important uh, P450 where cholesterol is a substrate. It's involved in a lot of biosynthesis. And the, and the uh, tryptophan tyrosine chain here has six units, not just two. By the way, in methane monooxygenase, another important enzyme, the chain is 14 units long <laughs> out to the surface. <laughs> so there is evidence that these chains are protective because they do all the, they all, all of them go all the way out to the surface. And the, uh, and the chains, the distance between the uh, redox active uh, amino acids to the chains always around three to four angstroms, meaning they're all well coupled. And the angular parts are uh, coupled well for overlap. Uh, they're not structural type uh, amino acids. They're not structural type. They look like they're electron, they're optimized for electron tunneling. Uh, so these are all the uh, aspects that I think uh, support our hypothesis that there are protective chains in all oxidative enzymes. Anyway, in this one, in this one, of course, the uh, tryptophanes now uh, are a little further. They're in nine to 12 angstroms. Uh, those are sort of the limits that we estimated when we started this work, but they're still active there. And according to our hopping map, based on uh, uh, tunneling timetables and and calculating the hopping times. Uh, now the uh, survival times now up to 500 nanoseconds. So these systems are allowing the enzyme to have 500 nanoseconds to oxygenate the uh, cholesterol. And at this point in our work, when we published this by this time, uh, theoreticians all over the world got involved in it to check us out because uh, our work is based on tunneling timetables and not, not on ab initio theory. Uh, so uh, David Baratan at Duke and his group decided they would check us out on this particular uh, one. And uh, they wrote a paper called 
defusing redox bombs. I should have thought of that. That's kind of a catchy title for what we're talking about. Um, and they showed that not only is our chain uh, about a microsecond or 500 nanoseconds to a microsecond, which they got in their more ab initio work, but they also calculated that the, uh, the redox cascade is just right. That is the, the potentials drop systematically all the way out to the surface as, as you would have to be the case for a functional chain. And so that's another bit of evidence. Then at this point, we realize that they're not only protective chains, but they're also can be functional chains. If you look at the active site of lignin peroxidase, it's a, it's a surface tryptophan because lignin is too big <laughs> to get into the active site in this heme enzyme. And so it has to, op the oxidation has to occur at the surface. And there's a nice functional chain that goes out to the tryptophan where it's the uh, oxygen's activated at the heme, of course. And then the whole time, whole, Whole hopping goes out to the surface to make the tryptophan radical cation, which is active, the active agent to uh, degrade lignin. When I when I figured this out, I said, "Well, you know, the blue copper oxidases uh, probably operate uh, maybe with this instead of the coppers. <laughs> the uh, canonical me the accepted mechanism for oxidation of substrates by multi copper oxidases like lacases." And, so forth, is that all the oxidation occurs, uh, oxygen's activated the trinuclear copper, but the, uh, the active site for ox oxidative reactions is the type one or blue copper. But I've always uh, questioned that because the blue copper in lacases is not, doesn't have high enough potential to oxidize cellulose or lignin. So now I'm looking for tryptophan again as the culprit. So we started looking at the uh, chains and uh, multi-copper oxidases. First of all, we found that there's a cation pi interaction with the tryptophan with the trinuclear oxygen activating site. So I'm pretty sure now that tryptophan is also involved in oxygen activation. And there is a chain from that tryptophan all the way out to the surface tryptophan. And so our new hypothesis on how uh, multi-copper oxidases operate is is oxygen's activated the trinuclear copper. Uh, the blue copper uh, sends electrons in as well for the oxygen activation, but the actual active site for cellulose and uh, organic substrates uh, is actually this surface tryptophan. There's a nice functional chain from tryptophan to, through the system out to surface tryptophan. So we're that's all unpublished work from us now, and we're working on writing that up. But this, uh, this, if this is right, it really makes a huge change in how we're about, we're now viewing the multi-copper oxidases and how they oxidize organic substrates. We still believe the blue copper is uh, the right active site for inorganic complexes like iron two to iron three and so forth, where the potentials. Are, are reasonable, but for the very high potential kinds of uh, organic substrates, we feel it has to be a tryptophan. So now to finish up my talk, uh, I'll go back to water splitting. Uh, life depends on water splitting uh, in order for green leaves. We, we would have a hard time, Morton, uh, living without oxygen. Uh, oxygen is, is is very good, and oxygen, as we know, is very but could be very bad. But uh, for us, it's mainly good. So uh, there's a worldwide effort to try to do artificial photosynthesis so that we can do do renewable energy and we can make materials and everything else uh, at anodes uh, using anodes that uh, catalytic anodes that make water into oxygen. Of course, uh, the search for a great water oxidation catalyst usually starts with the active site in photosystem two, the famous uh, calcium uh, manganese cluster that we thought would be the answer to all of our problems. All we'd have to do is take that out of uh, 
chloroplasts of green leaves and and it would do the job. But what, as Morton knows and Jasper knows and all sorts of other people know, when you take a an active site, a metallo cofactor active site out of a protein, it doesn't work anymore. It simply doesn't work anymore because it needs the protein interactions to tune its potential and its reorganization energies into sweet spots for reactivity. So uh, we're not going to be able to run uh, artificial photosynthesis with a synthetic uh, manganese calcium cluster. Uh, but we but synthetic inorganic chemists have come up with all kinds of good water oxidation catalysts. And uh, uh, some of the best ones uh, have iron and nickel. Iron looks like a good candidate for an oxo. <laughs> and that's where this, <laughs> that's where this talk is going because this talks about the importance of metal oxides. Also, there's a little nickel in it, which may be important. Uh, so these uh, iron nickel oxyhydroxide catalysts, which uh, hundreds of groups have worked on are very, very active for uh, water oxidation to uh, oxygen in basic solution. So my group, we decided we'd work out a uh, laser method to make uh, nanoparticles uh, that were multi-metal or metal oxide uh, water oxidation catalysts. So we have lots of lasers here at Caltech and uh, we have a, we took a triple DAG, a 350 five nanometer pulse laser with a nano, nine nanosecond pulse. And we, uh, we hit it, hit a metal powder surrounded in water. Uh, and this pulse laser blows up the metal powder in water to a plasma that, so initial, initial temperature you can calculate is about 70,000 Kelvin, but it cools in a few, microseconds to 10,000 Kelvin, down to 3,000 Kelvin, which we can measure by uh, oxygen emission lines. And then, uh, of course, uh, this plasma is confined under very high pressure in this water, and a uh, shock wave hits, and it uh, spits out nanoparticles, which by some miracle that we don't understand are all the same size. So we can make quantum confined uh, two or three nanometer particles with the right pulse energy and pulse widths. Um, for example, at uh, low pulse energies, around 30, 50, 60 millijoules per pulse, we can make a quantum confined uh, metal oxide nanoparticle. Um, for example, we can make cobalt oxide, the uh, two nanometer particles that are yellow, they're quantum confined, so they don't look anything like bulk cobalt oxide because they have real spectrum, they're quantum confined. And by the way, they're extremely good water oxidation catalysts. They have many more active sites in bulk, uh, black cobalt oxide. But the real power of our technique is we can make any mix, mixed metal catalyst you want simply by using one metal as a target and putting metal nitrates in solution to get the other metal in in the plasma. So for example, we can have a we can have an iron target and put in nickel nitrate, three molar nickel nitrate. We'll make the plasma, iron and nickel get together in the plasma and we get an iron nickel nanoparticle out, oxohydroxy oxo particle out. We can put in titanium, we can put in lanthanum, we can get whatever metals you want. And the three that I've bracketed here are extremely, extremely good water oxidation catalysts. They're robust, they, they can run on a electrocatalytically uh, for weeks without degradation and very low over potentials. They have these uh, layered hyd uh, double hydroxide structures shown on the left. And Brian Hunter and my group had the bright, bright idea, I think, of taking a water oxidation catalyst out of water, put it in acetonitrile with just a tiny amount of water so we could make the active intermediates and look at them electrochemically. Electrochemically, we can get all the way up to iron six system where the nickel in the system stays at nickel three. And we can interrogate these in situ by vibrational spectroscopy, either infrared or Raman. In both cases, we get the characteristic double uh, pattern of a cis dioxo iron six. 
We can take that activated intermediate and put a drop of water on it in acetonitrile and evolve oxygen to go back. And then we can go back and forth and back and forth doing these single turnover experiments to show that this iron six cysteoxo is in fact the active intermediate for water oxidation. We can do Musbauer back and forth. And of course the catalyst is mainly iron three and only at the surface do we have a little iron six oxo. So you can see on the, right-hand panel up in the upper one, you can see that tiny little, tiny little uh, quadrupole doublet that's with an isomer shift that's consistent with an iron six species. We can also do iron six near iron emission. I love ligand field stuff. So, you know, if you have a ground state triplet, iron six with a tetrahedral like structure, you'll have a triplet ground state with a singlet a spin flip singlet excited state, which has a nice, sharp, atomic-like uh, near infrared emission. In our case, it's six, a little over 1630 nanometers. And ferrate, which is a known iron-6 system, this luminescence is at 1613. And this, we, uh, we can also go back and forth, anodically polarize it and then quench it, anodically polarize it and show that this is, once again, the active intermediate. So we published a paper in Joule on this mechanism, this water oxidation mechanism, in which we have a key on the left, the cis dioxo iron. We have nickel there in green. Uh, we, by vibrational spectroscopy, we show that this iron six cis dioxo internally converts to a, in an internal redox reaction to a side bonded peroxo iron four. Then the nickel comes into action. Nickel three oxidizes this by an electron. So we get oxygen. And our paper is so technical that nobody could figure it out. So Holger Dow in Germany did us a great favor by writing a paper explaining our mechanism. <laughs> we, we always need help from our friends. Uh, and Holger, Holger did a very nice paper in which he showed how our mechanism stacks up against the regular photosystem too, the famous S-state mechanism. We start with iron three, we go to iron four and five. Iron six, this dioxo goes to the, but the S4 state in photosynthesis is, is like our uh, cis dioxo iron, which collapses to the OO bond making system to the side bonded peroxo and then nickel oxidation in the system. So nickel plays an important role, but it's the iron oxo that's really the, really the active intermediate. So the bottom line is, and I'm winding up now because I time, my time is almost up and I'm not a synthetic organic chemist, so I don't have to talk for three hours. Um, I can talk with 50 minutes, I think. This of course recording will get me in trouble with all the synthetic organic chemists in the world, but that's okay. I'll. I'll take their criticism. Here are the three water oxidation mechanisms that we know now, they're pretty good evidence for all three. There's the uh, iron, there's the water oxidation mechanism, a single center that goes through a triple bond oxo that's electrophilic enough to attract the nucleophilic uh, hydroxide to make the O bond and then off to oxygen. That we know operates with ruthenium systems uh, and it may well uh, operate for photosystem too. Down at the bottom is a mechanism that's uh, now in fashion for photosystem two, that is uh, two manganese fours uh, that where you get oxos that are coupled through radical coupling to make the OO bond and then off to oxygen. And now the one we've added is the uh, in, in, if we did it for photosystem two, it would be a manganese five cis dioxo that would then internally couple uh, to the side bonded manganese three peroxy and often oxygen. Um, our, our mechanism is different from the ones proposed for photosystem two. So it'd be interesting if some of the theoreticians in this field would have a look at our mechanism for photosystem two to see if it had, see if it's a reasonable contr contributor. The bottom line is though, and what does this all mean? Uh, this all means that if we can do water oxidation uh, really 
and robust catalytic systems at, at electrodes, we can do a lot for the future because in the future, uh, for years and years and years, we're going to have four molecules to work with, water, methane, carbon dioxide, and nitrogen. We're going to have sunlight for energy. And my feeling is that we're going to have PV electrolyzers, uh, not fancy uh, uh, integrated systems. I think, you know, now with silicon solar cell technology, where it is, you can get electrons from sunlight now. You can get electricity almost free from sunlight. So we can take the hits by wiring it to a custom electrolyzers with custom anodes and custom cathodes uh, to make all the fuels and chemicals and ammonia for food, and methanol and hydrogen. All of these that we can make with cathodes for hydrogen, cathodes for nitrogen reduction to ammonia, anodes for water oxidation, anodes for methane oxygenation. And also I think we'll have, a, we'll have anodes for ammonia oxidation because ammonia also could be a very good fuel for the future. So this is where I think it's going. I think our future is gonna be PV electrolyzers. Uh, not everybody agrees with that. But my feeling is this, uh, you, can, you can get so much current and, potential out of these silicon solar arrays that you can drive these big electrolyzers with hundreds of amps and, and make enormous amounts of products. And that, that's where I think we should be going. So that's my story about the importance of metal oxos. Here's my thank you slide. Uh, Jay Winkler has been my collaborator for many, many years. And in my P450 group, you can see there's a bunch of Danes on that. <laughs> I've, got, I've, got, I've gotten a lot of help from Danes. Uh, Torsten, uh, this is me, Meta Sorensen's been in my group. And, and then some folks are on, on our papers uh, who are also Danes and uh, on the list. Uh, but I thank them all for all this work uh, we've done on P450. And in the Catalyst, uh, Katharina Brinker, to, who was postdoc in my lab has done a lot of beautiful work on catalyst for nitrogen reduction to ammonia and collaborated with her. Uh, she's now has a faculty job in England. Astrid Mueller uh, and Brian Hunter, uh, all of these folks developed these methods to make heterogeneous catalysts that we've worked with for water oxidation. Astrid's now a professor at Rochester and Brian is a new professor at Northwestern. And of course, after all of our group meetings, we head for a bar. Uh, it was a local uh, bar um, that uh, you can see us enjoying. Uh, unfortunately, we can't get Carlsberg here uh, very easily. And so, um, I don't know, Carlsberg should, two board should sell more beers in the U.S. so we could drink it. We, we usually have to go for silly kinds of Italian and Dutch beers. And that's a disaster. But anyway, uh, thank my group. And uh, I think my time is up now, Jesper. And thank you all for listening to this uh, rambling talk of mine. And uh, But I hope I've convinced you that metal oxos are really, really very important in, in life. Thank you.